Welcome to the fourth video on inverse Laplace. This video is focused on quadratic factors in the denominator. We're going to assume that students are already competent on the basic inverse Laplace techniques with simple factors. So they can use the cover-up rule for simple factors and the expansion technique. In essence, anything covered in the first few videos. <coughs> this video is going to focus on how you deal with quadratic factors which will arise when you have complex poles. So first, let's remind ourselves about the lookup table. Now, we've dealt with the first four factors really in the first two videos. That's uh, simple steps, ramps, um, and exponential signals. Now, we want to look at signals of this form, let's say sine and cosine, which you will see have quadratic denominators. Or you could have decaying sinusoids, which you see have a slightly more complicated denominator, but still in quadratic form. Let's remind ourselves of the key steps in an inverse Laplace procedure. The first step is to identify the denominator factors r, i of s. And these need to be quadratic factors where the roots are complex. The second step is to do the partial fractions, that is to take your original transfer function q over p and write it as c1 over r1 plus c2 over r2 all the way up to cn over rn, where the r, i of s are in minimal form, where minimal form will be something like s plus a for real roots and a quadratic for complex roots. Step three is by inspection um, from the table once you've got the partial fractions in the appropriate form. So what do we do with these quadratic factors? The first thing is to identify the key structure. So we've got forms alpha of s over s squared plus omega squared, and these correspond to terms sine omega t and cos omega t. So in other words, if you see a denominator of the form s squared plus omega squared, it tells you you've got a sine and a cos component in your solution. Alternatively, if you see a denominator of the form s plus a all squared plus omega squared, you've got signals of the form e to the minus at sine omega t or e to the minus at cos omega t. How much sine or cos depends on beta of s. So what do we need to do next? We need to rearrange the numerators so they also match the forms in the table. So we're going to show this on the next slide so you get the idea of what we're trying to do. Let's assume we've got a transfer function, here it is, q over d of s times s plus a or squared plus omega squared. So the d of s can be a lot of simple roots or other things, but not too interested. But what we've identified is there's a quadratic factor, the s plus a squared plus omega squared. Now what we're going to do is we're not going to write that as a single c1 over r1. Instead, you'll see we've written it down as two separate terms. The first term corresponds to an a e to the minus a t sine omega t. And the second one corresponds to a b e to the minus a t cos omega t. So we've looked at the forms we have in the table and we have deliberately written our partial fractions to be made up of the forms in the table. Hence, on the left, a omega in the numerator, and on the right, b times s plus a in the numerator. Alternatively, if we've got something of the form s squared plus omega squared in the denominator, then our partial fractions are going to be made up of a term a omega, over s squared plus omega squared, and that corresponds to an a sine omega t, and bs over s squared plus omega squared, and that corresponds to a b cos omega t. Now, just to remark, if there are lots of quadratic factors in the denominator, then you shouldn't really be getting this in an exam. Certainly you would never get it from me, because that seems to be algebra for the sake of it, which rather defeats the object. If it were me, and that were the case, I'd say use a computer. So we've got an example now, a numerical example, of how to do partial fractions when you've got a quadratic factor in the denominator. And you'll notice we're starting with a very simple example, 
where the whole denominator is just a quadratic factor. So what's the first step? You'll see I've put it in this balloon here. Rearrange the denominator into a form in the table. Well, you can see what the denominator is, s squared plus 4s plus 13. So if we put that in the form in the table, there it is. You can see we've got s plus 2 all squared plus 3 squared. And that matches one of the e to the minus at sine or e to the minus at cos terms. Next, we need to look here and say, all right, but the numerator doesn't match the form in the table. So we now need to match the numerator. So here comes the second step. We say, what forms in the table have this denominator? So here they are. We've got the form 3 over s plus 2 all squared plus 3 squared, and that corresponds to an e to the minus 2 sine 3t. And we've got a sine, sorry, an s plus 2 over s plus 2 all squared plus 3 squared, and that corresponds to an e to the minus 2t cos 3t. So what we've said is that we want to make f of s as some combination of these two Laplace transforms, because once I've got it into those Laplace transforms, I can do inverse Laplace by inspection. So in essence, we're saying we've got A of this one and B of this one, and we want to add those together to get F. So let's see how we do that. So here we go. Here's my original transform on the left, and here's A of my sine term and B of my cos term. Now, clearly, these two match if these two numerators match. Now, I'm not going to solve that here because you can see the principle. That's simple simultaneous equations in A and B. But once you solve for A and B, you can see this is your solution. Right. What happens when you get slightly more complicated problems? So you don't just have a quadratic factor in the denominator, but you also have some simple poles as well. Now, you're going to need to use the expansion technique in order to solve for the numerator of the quadratic factors. And that will give you some simultaneous equations. But what I would recommend is do not use the expansion technique to identify all the poles because you will end up with a lot of simultaneous equations and therefore quite cumbersome algebra. You can minimize the total number of simultaneous equations by first identifying the residues for all the simple poles. And to do this, I would use the cover up rule. So the following two examples will show this and they should be enough for you to be able to use the technique in general. So here we go. I've given you quite nasty looking transfer function. 4 times s minus 1 divided by s plus 3 into s squared plus 6x plus 10. Now you can see clearly there's a simple pole, s plus 3, and there's a quadratic factor, s squared plus 6x plus 10. So the first thing to do is to write the general partial fraction form that I'm looking at. So here we go. You can see we have an a of s plus 3 for the simple pole and a b plus c times s plus 3 over s plus 3 squared plus 1 squared. So we've taken the quadratic factor and we've put it into the suitable form for the table. That's this s plus 3 all squared plus 1 squared. And then we've also written the numerator in the appropriate form. So you can see the corresponding to omega squared is this 1 squared. So we've got b multiplied 1 gives you the sign term. And then we've got the s plus 3 here, so we've got c times s plus 3 here. So now we know what structure we want for our partial fractions. What do we do next? Well, the first thing to do is to get the a. And we can do that using the cover-up rule, and therefore life will be very easy. So we can see that there's a factor a over s plus 3, so I set s equal to minus 3, cover up the s plus 3, and hence solve for a. So we did this on the previous video. Here we go. You can see I've written out g of s. That's this term here. And I've substituted in s equal minus 3. And that's why you can see a minus 3 here, and a minus 3 here, and a minus 3 here. So all I've done is written out g of s. And wherever there was an s, I've put minus 3. However, 
I've also covered up the S plus 3. So if I solve for that, there you go, you get A equals minus 16. So the next step, having solved for A, is to ask how we might solve for B and C. And so what we do here is we use the expansion technique. So we multiply everything out by the denominator, and that gives us 4 times S minus 1 on the left, A times S squared plus 6X plus 10, plus B plus C times S plus 3, times s plus 3. OK? Now, I need to multiply this out uh, in a bit more detail so we can see what's happening. So on the left, I get 4s minus 4. And then if I group together all the s squared terms on the right, you can see I've got an s squared from the a and an s squared from the c. So there we go, s squared times a plus c. If I group all the s terms together, you'll see I've got 6a plus b plus 6c. And if I group all the constants together, I get that term there. So now in terms of the expansion technique, what we do is we match the coefficients of s squared, s, and the constants on the left and the right. So here we go. First, the coefficients of s squared. We've got naught on the left, a plus c on the right. So that gives us c equals minus a, or c equals 16. And here, again, you will see the advantage of having calculated a already is we get c immediately instead of a simultaneous equation. You'll see on the left we have 4, and on the right we have 6a plus b plus 6c. We solve this, and because we already know a and c, that gives us b equals 4. Again, you'll see the advantage of having calculated a first is we've got c from a simple equality, and now we've got b from a simple equality. No simultaneous equations needed anywhere. Now finally, we do a check. We match the constants, so we've got minus 4 on the right, this expression, uh, sorry, on the right and minus 4 on the left, and we check, and what you will see is it all matches. Finally, you plug the numbers in to the original formula, and you can calculate the underlying signal g of t as e to the minus 3t times minus 16 plus 4 sine t plus 16 cos t. In this case, we've got g of s written as 5 over s plus 1 times s squared plus 4. And you'll see the particular denominator factor here, s squared plus 4, is representative of a pure sinusoid. So first I do my normal partial fractions. I write a over s plus 1 for the real pole, and then 2b plus cs over s squared plus 2 squared for the quadratic factor. And you'll notice I've used the 2 here because it matches the 2 here. Right, as before, what we're going to do is identify the coefficient a first because we can get this residue using the cover-up rule simply by setting s equal to minus 1 and covering up the s plus 1. So there we go. I've done it very quickly for you. I've written a equals 5 over minus 1 squared plus 4. And you'll notice this is equivalent to g of s but with the s plus 1 cancelled. So you could say it's the same as g of s times s plus 1. Now, we use the expansion technique to determine the remaining two coefficients. So I multiply out by the denominator, and here we go, 5 on the left, a times s squared plus 4, plus 2b plus cs times s plus 1 on the right. If I expand that out in more detail, 5 equals s squared times a plus c plus s times 2b plus c, plus 4a plus 2b. And now we use the standard, standard trick of equating coefficients of s squared, s, and the constant. So if I look at the coefficient of s squared, I can see it's 0 on the left, a plus c on the right, and therefore I get c equals minus a, or c equals minus 1. If I look at the coefficients of s, I've got none on the left, 2b plus c on the right, and therefore b equals 0.5. And then finally, I look at the constants just to check that I've not made a silly error. So I've got 5 on the left, 4a plus 2b on the right, and I check that that actually matches. And hence, if you look at the overall solution, g of s becomes 1 over s plus 1, plus, oh, that should be a 0.5, times 2, 
minus s over s squared plus 2 squared, and that corresponds therefore to an e to the minus t plus 0.5 sine 2t minus cos 2t.